Okay. And I am so thankful that the screens came on just about seven minutes ago. So <laughs> it's not a, maybe a big deal to some of you, but oh, it is to me. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to start with uh, Sardis today. We're continuing with Sardis. And our lesson is Sardis, you're being called to grow up called to maturity because if you remember this is the church that thought they were alive and Jesus said you're not and he, he wasn't talking about physical death he's talking about spiritual death they were not growing they were very stagnant so we're going to start by reading the first uh, three verses of the letter he says to the angel of the church in Sardis write these things says he now remember he comes a different way to each church, depending on what they need. To this church, he says, I have the seven spirits of God. That's where we're going to land today. And the seven stars. To every church, does he say, I know your works? Every one of them. So he's evaluating their works. He says, you have a name that you're alive, but I say you're dead spiritually. He goes on to say, so you need to be watchful and you need to strengthen everything that remains because they're ready to die. Because I have not found your works perfect. That means mature or complete. So they start out well, but then they stop. So that's, that's the point. They start out maybe good in their spiritual life. They're justified, covered by the blood, but for some reason... It just comes to a halt, and they don't continue to grow. So here's his advice. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard. How did we receive Jesus Christ? By grace through faith. He says, you remember that, and now I'm supposed to walk by grace through faith. And he says, you hold fast to that and repent. So you have been going in your works for sanctification, you're to repent. So you turn from that and you go the opposite direction. And he says, I've got the Holy Spirit that you need to complete the work. So that's where we're going to land today. So I'm going to start with several powerful truths that you and I need to have as a basis for this lesson. First of all, every believer begins as a baby in Christ. True? Yeah, just like our physical birth, we all began as little babies, as infants. And the same thing with a uh, spiritual birth. Every believer is just a baby when they start. And we have a command from Peter in 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. So listen to what he says to a newborn, a new convert, a brand new one. He says, you should be like a newborn baby. And this word of God, he says, you should be craving it. Newborn baby, you crave this word. You crave it. What does that mean? I thirst for it. Like the psalmist says, as the deer pants for the water, so my heart pants for you. You thirst for it. You earnestly desire. And he said, you need the pure and adulterated. And adulterated, it's not watered down. It's not sugar-coated. It is the actual pure word of God that by it. What is it? This. This is it. This is how you will be nurtured, and this is how you will grow into a completed salvation. So have I been justified when I'm born again? Yes. Now, how am I going to be sanctified? Right here. You get in the word, surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, and your sanctification and your growth will happen. Now, will you be totally sinless this side of heaven? No, none of us are. But you should be sinning less and less. And if you're in the word, the Holy Spirit should be convicting you more and more. And you should be sensitive to those promptings. I used to pray, oh, God, make me a quick confessor. You know, no argument, because if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and you have a wrong thought or something, does he convict you? He will, I mean, he will let you know. 
And as long as you respond and you're obedient, you're sensitive to that. But if you continue to just, I'm not listening, I'm not responding, I'm not confessing, and I'm not repenting, you can grieve and shut off the Holy Spirit so he doesn't have a whole lot of effect on you. So you need to be craving this, newborn believer, and some of us didn't start craving it for years. I'm pointing to myself. Okay, so we'll get into that. Now, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, what did he tell him? He said, man shall not live by bread alone. How am I going to live and have life? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how we are going to have this life of Jesus Christ lived in us. John MacArthur said, your spiritual growth in Christ, is that God's will for us is to grow in Christ? Yes, it will grow out of when I start craving this. When I start craving the word, my spiritual growth in Christ will take place. Yes. And so I used to pray many years ago, God, would you give me a ravenous appetite for your word that cannot be satisfied? Will he answer that prayer? Yes, because it's his will. So if you pray things that's in his will, in his word, he will answer that. And I wanted, I just want to be so hungry for your word I just see things like the layers of the onion being peeled back. Wow, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that. I want to see more. And so that ravenous appetite, it's strong and it's a compelling craving to be in God's word. If you don't have that, you need to pray for it. And I'm serious. You need to pray that he will give you that kind of a hunger for his word. So here's a prayer. I think I wrote it in your notes even. God, grant me a ravenous appetite for your word, a deep hunger that I will consume your word, I will meditate on your truths, so that I will be nourished and transformed by your living message. That's what will transform us, are the truths out of this word, as you put yourself in his hands, surrendered to him, say, I want to be a vessel of honor a clean vessel before you, and will you just give me that appetite? And boy, here I am. Let your word do its work in me. So you just put yourself out there. And he says, you've already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord. Have you tasted that? Yes. When you were born again, did you taste it? Yes, you go to Psalm 103. I don't know if I put that in your notes. Psalm 103, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. With everything that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. He forgave all of my iniquities. He has redeemed my life from the pit of destruction. Have I tasted and seen the goodness of him before? Yes, when he redeemed me. So therefore, because of that, I should be craving the word. And I should just continue in the word. So another spiritual truth we need to make sure we understand. Is spiritual maturity God's objective for all of you? Yeah, he wants all of us to mature. It's not just for the elite or for the people on staff. It's for all of us. And so we're going to look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And Paul says, come grow with us. That's his message. Just come and grow with him. And so he starts in verse 13. He said, God gave some as apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why does he have different people? It's to equip the people, the saints of the church. And also, we are to be building up the body of Christ. Now, is the body of Christ just First Baptist Church? No. The body of Christ is a church universal. And it's for every believer, no matter what denomination they're sitting under, if they are a blood-bought, redeemed uh, salvation in Jesus Christ, then they're part of the body. Why do we study? Why do we have teachers and people? To build that body of Christ up. How long? Notice the next phrase. Until we all, 
notice all of us, the whole body, till we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, so all of us become a mature man or woman. Mature man. And how do we know when we're mature? It's the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Jesus Christ. So here is the yardstick. Who is that? It's Jesus Christ. And here we are, and people are at all different places, right? So we're working to equip the saints and build till everyone comes to a measure of fullness and they're mature in Jesus Christ. So that's the purpose. Why? He goes on and answers the question. So we will no longer be little children. We have got to get out of the toddler department. No longer be children because what happens to children? They get tossed to and fro by the waves and some new doctrine comes along. Somebody's got a new revelation and people, children will chase it. I'm going to go after that. And then after they're in it for a while, they say, you know, I don't think that's right. But if you're mature in the word, you won't go after every little thing that comes along. He said, because there's people out there by human cunning, they are crafty, they have deceitful schemes, and they're lying in wait to deceive you and me. There are many out there that want to lead believers down a wrong path. So, look at Paul's concern for his church, his flock in Galatia. He said, my little children, I am in labor and in travail again. Is a pastor, a teacher usually in labor? Trying, he says, I, until Christ is formed in all of you, completely and permanently formed in you. And he pleads with them, Get, let Christ be formed in each of you. He wanted that for his whole flock. He taught them. He labored till they all would come to be formed in Jesus Christ and become mature. Next spiritual truth, one of my favorite little slides. Praise God, the slide can be seen. Spiritual maturity is lacking in many believers. You'd look at a church on Sunday mornings, because that's when the, the best crowd's there, and you will have a large percentage of people sitting in the pew who are still immature believers. And they haven't grown up. You see that in every church. And he says to this guy, he just wants strained biblical doctrine. Most people don't want any doctrine that's going to step on their feet. They don't want any doctrine that's going to make them have to give up their pet sin, change anything in their life. So all they want is just the baby food. And as much as you plead with them, come on, you need to grow. And it's not because they haven't had time. Many of us were immature for years. I was. Because we haven't applied ourselves. A lot of it I didn't really understand. I'm not making an excuse. But I didn't understand the Holy Spirit working in me. I knew I had him, but I didn't really, I thought I could do this and this and this, and that would make me more spiritual. That's, that's being deceived, getting off on a wrong path. And so, as I learned, it's the Holy Spirit that will do all this in me. It really began to change me. So, A.W. Tozer says, the average Christian, just average, is not Christ-like. I think that's a pretty true statement. And he says, most Christians live a sub-Christian life. They're not living in the victorious life that they could have, the life of Jesus Christ being really manifested in them where they have victory over sin in their life, victory over their circumstances. You see them to be joyful even if their circumstances are not good. Y'all agree? It's hard to find people that can rise above and the Holy Spirit working in them and through them, they become better than an average Christian. He says most Christians live subpar, sub-Christian life. And he goes on to say, like these at Sardis, the average Christian is not willing to obey the command 
You are to grow up in Christ, spiritual growth, and become mature. Well, I might have to give up something I'm watching on television. I might have to give up doing some of the things I enjoy doing. I might have to give up some of the friends, some of the conversations I have. Ask God to put the desire in your heart that you want to be the child of God, the mature child of God that he's called you to be. Because the call to grow up and mature is to all of us. And most of us have to give up something. We're going to have to change our life. We've got to make study in the word more of a priority. Because if I don't get in the word and let it wash over me, I'm not going to change much. You might have to say, okay, uh, there's this TV show I really like. Are you willing to give it up and spend that 30 minutes or an hour in his word? Meditating on it, praising him, thanking him. See, it's, it's, a, it's a choice. We all have the same 24 hours. So it's a choice of what you do with your time. And he says, Tozer says, God is not going to compromise with any of us over the issue of disobedience to truth. He's revealed truth to us. And if we don't pay much attention to it and we reject it, he may not reveal any more truth to us. And we can squelch uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We can squelch his convicting of us. And we don't want to reach that point. Tozer says, and here's my, I used to sit on the bench with these people, sit on this pew. People are sitting around in the church just as though the axle has broken and they don't make progress for years. Now, all of them, including me, down here every time the doors open, sitting on that piano bench, going to choir practice, working in children's church, doing all kinds of stuff, but it, there was no internal growing and maturing in me. Just doing it. And they're stopped by disobedience. You know, they say in most churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work in the church. And I think you'll find that in churches of all kinds. You've got the people that will be in there, you know, witnessing and doing all the things that they uh, are called to do. But they're the ones doing it. Oh, and I love this one. Anyone who knowingly refuses to obey will be brought to a distinct halt in their spiritual life. Have you known people that you knew you could see that they were growing and then all of a sudden things come into their life and you can tell they've stopped? Maybe it's uh, some circumstance that they, they're still kind of angry and bitter because God allowed it to come in their life. But why does he send trials and tribulations into our life? To grow us. You have to have that. This is an opportunity to grow. And so you have to look at that. You have to change your mindset. But people still are angry at God and they have roots of bitterness against something God has allowed in their life. But these are always to get us to turn to him and say, whatever you need to teach me, I'm willing. So Tozer goes on to say, you are either drifting with regard to your salvation because of neglect. And that's what I did for a long time. Neglecting the word because I was so busy. A few of you are shaking your head. You agree. Or you are growing because it's deliberate effort and attention. But the truth is none of us will grow by accident. Oh, I want to grow and I want to become mature in Christ. And you know what? If I don't put the effort in what he tells me to do to get in the word and everything, it is not going to happen. And a year later, I'll be just like I was a year ago. Well, that's not even a true statement. Because if you're not growing, what are you doing? You're going backward. So this is a great picture, I think, because you've got people that are maybe in the word, they're new Christians, and do a lot of people think, boy, I'm a Christian now, everything's going to be rosy. I think a lot of people thought that I've got my ticket to heaven. Man, this is great. Let me tell you, people need to be told up front when you're mentoring them, 
This is a battleground. Satan and your flesh do not want you to grow. And so uh, D.L. Moody says, I think we are down here. God is polishing us for a service to come later. So this is a, think of this, uh, Paul says, uh, you are in the army of the Lord. Does he also say you're in a race? Yes, and you're supposed to have purpose in the race, direction, go for the prize. And so he is preparing us for a greater life to come. And I'm in boot camp, and what I understand, boot camp isn't a whole lot of fun. I asked some of the men that have been in the military. Now, a lot of times we're going through things that aren't a great deal of fun. We, we have all kinds of issues in our lives, all of us do. But he's preparing us. I'm learning how to respond correctly. I'm learning to let him grow me through him, give me victory in him, and let him refine me and polish me. Because we have a thousand years of our life waiting for us in his kingdom. How do you want to live in that thousand years in his kingdom? Your actions now will tell us how much you really want to be everything in his kingdom that he has for you. So at the moment of justification, you tell people, especially when they're just new Christians and they're, they've just been justified, guess what? You're in a race. And maybe the question might be, what am I racing for? There's a prize. There's a prize waiting for us. And we are to be focused and keep that prize uh, in, our, um, in our mindset. And then we're given a command, you are to walk in the Spirit. That means I'm led by the Spirit. I'm yielded to Him, asking Him to lead me. What do you have for me today? Just walk in the Spirit. And what is your promise? You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's an amazing promise. But you can't claim that if you're not walking in the Spirit. So you walk in the Spirit, ask Him to lead you and guide you, to convict you, to do His work in you, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And remember, we're preparing for a greater life to come. And I think that's what a, a lot of people I talk to, they don't know about the kingdom, and they don't know that they have an opportunity to serve with Jesus in it. And I think if people knew that, it would really revolutionize the way that they are living here. So, remember churches, uh, Sardis is the Reformation Church. Remember they had been under the oppression of the Catholic Church, all the indulgences and everything. Martin Luther discovers, you know, in his readings, the just shall live by faith. So, the Reformers came out of all of that, and they started really well. You and I also need a Reformation in our lives what we need is the Holy Spirit to complete the work that he started in me. Did you do anything to become a born-again Christian? You receive the gift, but you did nothing. It's, I am saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, but I accepted that. Conviction came upon me, the Holy Spirit drew me, and I acted on it. And so he started the work. Now, I need to allow him to mature me and grow me up into the fullness of Christ because I can't do it even though I tried for years. I'm getting more spiritual. But yet, if you knew what was going on inside of me, envy, jealousy, having a critical spirit, that is not maturing in Christ. No. So, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews a little bit because he is gravely concerned about the Jewish Christians of his day. What were they doing? We have the, it's a Jewish people that he's talking to. Had they been in Judaism under the law? Yes, but many of them recognized when they learned about it in the preaching and so forth in the New Testament days, Jesus Christ, he is the Messiah. He's the one that's prophesied in the Old Testament and they accepted him. Okay, but what's going on in the New Testament days? Persecution on those Jews. Who's persecuting them? The religious Jews. 
are persecuting them. And they're, they're saying, I cannot, I just cannot endure under this persecution. So what were they threatening to do to make life easier? I'm going to go back over here and put myself back under this legalism and the Jewish stuff and slitting the lamb and offering the sacrifices. And they would never know the power of the Holy Spirit. If you put yourself back under that. So the writer in Hebrews is very concerned. That's what they're going to do. So we are going to look at chapter 4. And these are called the let us. So I have a little head of let us there. That's how you remember them. Chapter 4 is the let us chapter. So what does he say in verse 1? Let us fear that none of you will be found to have fallen short. You remember the east siders in the lesson last week they wanted to stay over on the east side because we're content over here we don't need to cross the jordan we just want to live over here look at that pasture it's so good for our cows remember that that's what he's talking about let us fear that any of you will fall short of that and you will not cross over you enter and go into the promised land enter and claim it Verse 11, we need let us labor so we will enter that. Verse 14, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. And verse 16, do you need help in all of this? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace where we can find grace and mercy to help in time of our need. So he's taken them through all of that. Now he's going to chapter 5 and he's so excited. He's got this group of people that are born again. And he said, I want to start getting into the meat of the word. It's not going to work with them. He says, I'm going to start telling you about the heavenly priesthood of Christ, but they are not listening. They're sitting there with their eyes glazed over, like water off a duck's back, looking at their watch, scrolling on their phone, sending text and all of that. Right? Right? Okay, you're not ready. He said, I've taught you that Jesus is our high priest. And he said, previously, you learned that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is your Savior. He's the Word. He's your shepherd. He's your mediator. You learned all that. And that's when you became justified and born again. But I want to talk to you about his priestly thing. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And they're like, who? You know why? Why are they confused? Because... The priest has to be a member of what tribe? Levi. And Jesus is a tribe of Judah. So can Judah be a priest in their mind? I mean, can Jesus be a priest? No. So they're all confused. They're trying to figure this out. And he says, but Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So you have to go back and understand that before you can understand Melchizedek and how Jesus is a priest after that. So you've got to understand the whole counsel of God. You have to have the Old Testament to understand the New and vice versa. So you've got to study this to understand how Jesus Christ was a high priest like Melchizedek. So he wants them to have a deeper understanding of Scripture. Had they been born again for a while? Yeah, but they're they're thinking about going over here. He's trying to get them deeper into the meat of the Word, but they just can't handle it. And so you know what he's going to do in chapter 5, verse 11? Hit the pause button. We can't talk about this any longer. And he's going to go clear to chapter 7, verse 1, before he hits the pause button and releases it, and he goes back to Melchizedek. Because he's got to get them ready for that. So let's see what he's going to talk to them about. We know that they are tempted to go back into legalism. They're not going on to maturity in Christ. Why are you not understanding the deeper truths? He said, it's because you're not going on to maturity. Do you see my congregation up there? Yes. Yes, all those little kids. You know, we want to go back to the nurse. Please tell me about Moses and how he was in that little basket. And let's talk about David and Goliath and all of that. They want to go back to all the little Bible stories that they understand until you start digging deeper under different levels of those stories. They just want to hear the stuff that they kind of like. You and I are no different. 
As Gentile believers, you and I don't have the same problem. I'm not going over to a synagogue and go ask to slit a lamb's throat. But many of us are tempted to fall back into legalism and trying to do things on my own as opposed to the freedom that I actually have in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, the enemy has got that trap of legalism on every one of us, wanting us to get back into legalism, thinking there's, I've got to do this and I've got to do this and this so that I am acceptable to God, so he approves of me. I had that attitude for a long time. So Paul in Galatians, he's very concerned with this church in Galatia, and he says, who has bewitched you? So what's going on at the believers in Galatia? They, by faith, they have received Jesus Christ, and they have they been empowered by the Holy Spirit? Have you been empowered by the Holy Spirit? We all have. But now they were agreeable to a false form of sanctification. That's what gets most of us. For me to really be mature and for me to become sanctified and set apart, there's just stuff. Surely I have to do this, this, and this. They're falling back into legalism. That's what was happening in Galatia. And he said, you are acting very foolish. Now, what does that mean? In the Amplified, you're spiritually dull. You're unable to listen, receive, or act on the word. And you're not understanding. Your sanctification is impossible based on your works. So many of us start doing things. You know, churches, a lot of times somebody joins the church or they're born again, and what do they want you to do? You need to get busy. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, they need to be discipled, and they need to learn to grow in the Word. I wish that would have happened to me many years ago because I cannot sanctify myself on all the works that I am doing. That's against the Bible's teaching. He says, who has bewitched you? Somebody has cast an evil spell on you. You become fascinated, influenced, hypnotized. And he said, you're not obeying the truth. Who is the one that will do that work in me and through me? It's the Holy Spirit that will sanctify me in the word and set me apart. And then he prompts me for the works that he has ordained for me. He says, you say Jesus isn't enough. Was Jesus enough to save me from the fires of hell? So is he enough to sanctify me and mature me and grow me? Yes, but why do we take up and try to do it ourselves? You've been bewitched. He says, somebody has got you on that trap of legalism. He says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. And then he asked him a question, how were you born again? Is it because you were doing the works of the law? No. I knew the answer to that. He says, was it your faith that you put in Jesus Christ? Yes, that's how I was saved. He said, question, so after beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made complete by your flesh? That's what they were doing. That's what many of us do. And boy, does the flesh love it. Your flesh would love to be able to sanctify itself. And we get off on that trap, and we still, we get discouraged. I got burned out, all of those things, because I was trying to make myself pleasing to God so he would be, quote, proud of me or approve of me. I have nothing to do with it. I put myself in his hands. I get in the word, and he's the one that will uh, mature me and grow me. I asked myself this question in my testimony when I used to give it. Why was I willing to trade in the supernatural power for human effort? I traded it in. Human effort. I cannot tell you how many hours I've spent down here for 42 years. And years before that in another church. Doing and doing, thinking everything I'm doing surely is enough for God to approve of me. And you know what that does? That puts you in bondage. I'm right back in bondage. And I love this. I heard it on the radio the other day. You cannot achieve any spiritual goal by a carnal means. True statement. I can never 
achieve anything spiritual in my life by a carnal or a fleshly means. Never. So the Holy Spirit produces the spiritual life initially in me. Is he the one that has the power to sustain it? Yes. Are you living with energy and effort apart from the Holy Spirit? Ah, we do. Off and on. And sometimes we get convicted and, you know, we, I'll say I get back on track. But a lot of times is your flesh going to rise up and try to enter in on the process? <laughs> okay, so this term, you have fallen from grace. So I've talked about God's umbrella of grace before, and I think it really applies here. So here I am born again, and I want him to grow me and mature me into the fullness of Christ. But I have to stay under his umbrella of grace, under the power of the Holy Spirit for that to happen. Right? And it will take place. The Word of God, I'm under his umbrella of grace. But for some reason, maybe a bad crisis in my life, something comes along. And what happens? I walk over here and I get out from the un umbrella of grace. And it's me trying to deal with stuff. It's me trying to work everything out. And I have fallen out from under his grace. Right? Now, see, that's how I see it. So let's go on. Have you moved out of the sphere of grace? Are you in the bondage of performance and you've got rules and regulations that you have to do? That's what happened to the reformers. They said the just are going to live by faith, but what did they keep? Oh, you've got to do this and you've got to do this. And they had infant baptism. They had all kinds of things now, regulations and rules that they had to follow. Have you ceased to depend on God's resources and depend on your flesh? If you do, you're telling God, I don't believe you can sanctify me. Wow. That is bad. So what has happened? I have fallen from his grace. Does he tell me the Holy Spirit will grow me and mature me? He says he will. And I need to stay under that umbrella of his grace for it to happen. So Paul has a concern to the church at Corinth. So listen to what he says to them. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind is going to be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. So he's got a concern at every church he goes to. If you really start reading the New Testament, except for the Gospels, start over here with especially Paul's letters and Peter and James in them, are they always talking about how you need to grow and mature? It's on your walk. So those are a lot of the letters we need to focus on. So Paul has a concern here, and listen to verse 4. If somebody comes and preaches another Jesus to you that he didn't tell them about, are there, other, are there people out there today that are talking about a Jesus that isn't the Jesus of this Bible? Yes. Or if you receive another spirit. You know, they have games for little children to learn to call on their spirit guides. They're teaching other spirits. If you get any spirit that you're looking after besides the Holy Spirit of here, he says, or if you receive another gospel which you didn't accept, he said, I'm afraid you're going to go after it. So a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit. Paul says, I'm afraid you're going to go after it. And in Galatians verse 1, chapter 1, the sixth verse, here's his letter to them. He's just started greeting them, and he says, I am marvel, I'm astonished, I cannot believe that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, and you're going after another gospel. Verse 6, here's his letter. And he said, I just can't believe you've experienced the grace of God. You are born again. You are saved. And it didn't take long. And you're already going after something different other than what this word says. So we're going to look at Hebrews 5. Remember, we've got these people that they, could, they can't learn about Melchizedek. So he's put his teaching on pause. And now he's going to give them some warnings. And so he said, you have a lack of spiritual growth and you're not making any progress towards maturity. And until you start maturing, we cannot move on in our teachings. So he says, 
chapter 5, verse 11. Remember, he has stopped. And he says, concerning him, he's talking about Jesus and Melchizedek. I have so much I want to tell you about it, but it's hard to explain to you because you're what? Dull of hearing. And he's going to talk about their immaturity and how they need to grow up. And the other bookend is chapter 6, verse 12. So let's look at that. This is where it's going to end. He says, why am I doing this? I'm putting this on pause. We've got to correct something because I don't want you to become lazy. I don't, but you need to imitate all those who through faith and patience have inherit, will inherit what's been promised. See, we've got, we've got to make sure we grow and mature. We've got to become like those who through their faith and their patience, and he's going to give them a list of them in chapter 11 when you go to the hall of faith. They will inherit what has been promised. You need to stay the course. Don't go back over here into your legalism. Stay away from it. Keep on the track of maturing in Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the work. I like this translation. It says, be like those who stay the course with committed faith and they'll get everything promised to them. That's the camp I want to be in. So, warning number three. This, there's five warnings in Hebrews and we're going to do number three. Make spiritual progress. It's time for you to mature and grow up. We must make spiritual progress. Is it a detriment to us and our soul if we don't? Is it possible that I, if I don't grow up and mature, I could lose my rewards at the judgment seat of Christ? It is. So wake up. Number one, he said, your problem is you're dull towards the word. He said, concerning him, I've got so much I want to tell you, but you're dull of hearing. So the word dull, you see my people sitting on the pew? You ought to look around sometime on Sunday morning. Look at the faces. You, I mean, you just glance. But you, can, you just sweep across there, and you can get a pretty good idea of people who are engaged. They're here. They want, they're hungry. They want to be fed. They want to grow in Christ. They're not thinking about, what are we having for lunch? Oh, let's see if anybody's texted me. Let's see what I'm making my grocery list. That's not a hunger for the word. Okay. He says you're being slothful. It's a condition of spiritual apathy and laziness that prevents spiritual development. You have no push. You don't really care if you grow. You're unable to listen to the word, receive it, and act on it. He said that's a sign of immaturity. I love the Greek word here. It is nothros. And what does it mean? A person who has the imperceptive and lethargic nature of a stone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Now, in chapter 5 of Galatians, Paul's been, he's talking to those Galatians, and he's so concerned about him. And he said, you were running so well. You were doing so well. Who prevented you now from obeying the truth? Who prevented you? And if you look up here, how do we start going backward? We drift. That lazy river, we start drifting, and we drift from the word. That's warning number one in Hebrews 2. That's going backward. And we start drifting from the word. If I'm not in the word, which is strengthening my faith in everything, what's going to happen to my faith? I become doubting. We will doubt God's word. And you say, I don't think I ever would. Oh, go about six months with no, not being in the word, not being around the fellowship of believers. We start drifting, and what happens? Suddenly, the, the arrows, Satan's arrows of doubt can come into our mind. Oh, I want y'all to look at this one. I have such a good section over here that looks and they respond. <laughs> okay, these are grown people. They've been saved for a long time. But what's the matter? They don't want to grow. Growing is hard. 
Many times there's growing pains and people hard of hearing. Sometimes you think people you're talking to are not listening to you. And you want to say, are you listening? <laughs> and it's not that they can't hear. <laughs> okay, Isaiah chapter 30. This, this is just amazing to me. They talk about the children of Israel. They're a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. And they say to the seers, you know, that's like the people that can see in the future. They say, do not see. And to the prophets, they say, don't prophesy to us what is right. Can you imagine you telling your preacher that? Speak to us smooth things. We only want to hear what will tickle our ears, what makes us feel good about ourselves. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Can you imagine? Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. We don't want to hear any more about the Holy One of Israel. That was God's people. Jeremiah 6, 16. Here was Jeremiah's advice to the people. Stand in the way and see. You need to ask for the old path. That's a good way. And there's where you need to walk. And you're promised you will find rest for your soul. Listen to the response of the people. We will not walk therein. Those are rebellious people. Also, the question, do you look for Bible teachers who just preach what you want to hear? There are people who have gone to churches that will affirm what they want. I've had mothers tell me, well, our church wouldn't affirm what my daughter or grandchild is doing, but we found a church that will, and they say it's okay with Jesus. Okay. But they're going to a place that isn't teaching the word. Okay. Or do you look for a real teacher who will preach truth to you, even if it disagrees with what you want to believe? So Tim, Paul told Timothy, the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they're going to heap to themselves teachers, because they have itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from truth, and people are going to be turned to listen to the fables, things that aren't true. So here's a problem that he says you have. I can't teach you anything deeper, he said, because you don't want anything new. Sometimes you have to chew on things. You've got to dig and you've got to understand. And they said, we don't want anything. I love this picture. I'm content to know just the fundamentals. I've got my ticket to heaven. What else do I need to do? What else do I need to know? I'm just going to, I'm content. That's like those East Siders. They're content with what they had, and they don't want to cross. And what was the result? The ones that didn't cross, they never saw the miracle of Jericho. They never saw the battles that were won. They never saw any of that. God giving victory over the enemies. And what happened to them while they stayed over here? First taken to captivity, and they went into idolatry. So, the Reformation Church, they came out with their claim, the just shall live by faith. And everybody was excited because they're now, they've got the Bible. It's been in English now. The printing press has happened, and everybody can read it for themselves. And we know the just are going to live by faith, but the road of sanctification, their mission failed. Because why? They started bringing back in some of the other things. This is where we have all millennialism. We have the church uh, has replaced Israel. They didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. They were now going back and doing some of the ritualistic things that they had brought from the Catholic Church. So they failed to go on to maturity, but they put themselves under rituals and traditions and disciplines, and they said, look at me, I am spiritually mature. Yes. So there he is, the spiritually mature guy. So they must overcome their deadness. Did Jesus say they were actually spiritually dead? You've got to overcome that because you're trying to perfect yourself with the work of your flesh. And in God's sight, everything I have done in my past 
in the strength of flesh, he says it's wood, hay, and stubble. Was I doing good things, right things? Yeah. But it was not out of being controlled, growing, and maturing in the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer says, we need an infusion of the Holy Spirit because religious activity that doesn't encourage and stimulate your personal relational growth with the Lord, it's a waste of your time. Many of us are involved in doing good things, right? And as believers, we're supposed to do them, right? But if all we do is go do all the good things and we don't have the relationship with Christ, he says it's no good. Empty religion is like digging your own grave. What about during the days when Christ was on earth? Did the Pharisees want to establish their own traditions from the law? So they didn't want any new truth. And they missed the Messiah. They missed their Savior. They missed their Redeemer because they would not listen to the new truth. In fact, they persecuted people who taught it, and people that believed it. So another spiritual truth for us. My spiritual life and yours depends that we communicate with the Holy Spirit, that I have a relationship with him. He can convict me, he can exhort me, he can teach me his word, and I listen and I respond. Spiritual growth comes from a vital infusion of new truth received daily from the Holy Spirit and the living, active Word of God. I hope as you're in your own Bible study, you're in the Bible sometime, and you say, "Ah, I have never seen that before. That's what you should be doing. This Word is alive and active. In fact, I think it's in Psalm 119. Adrian Rogers said, every day when I go to my study, He uses Psalm 119 in about three verses that he prays. Lord, open my eyes to wondrous truths in this word. Truths. Truths. Can't say it. Open my eyes to it. Incline my ear to your word. Before you open and start studying. For this cause, Paul said to the Thessalonians, Remember, I thank God without ceasing because... When you received the word of God that you heard Paul teach, you received it and you agreed it is not the word of a man. It is in truth the word of God. And the word of God will work effectually in you that believe it. It will be very effective in you. He who has ears, let him hear. So in Psalm 119, The psalmist says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And there's a song out, word of God speak. Would you fall down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty. All that reverential awe and fear of the Lord to see who he is. Remember when Isaiah went in the temple? He's filled with awe, the majesty of God himself. Number two, an immature person that's not growing cannot share. They have an inability to share, just like little children. He says, by this time you should be a teacher, all of you. By this time you should be a teacher, but you need somebody to teach you again. Oh, we're going to go back to the ABCs. That's what you want. So it's a regression, failing to advance and lack of development. So instead of helping others to grow, they are in need of learning again the simple teachings. It's like going through a second childhood. And I know all of you know at least one person that you can share with what what you have learned and what you're learning. All of you. So the ability to share with people is a mark of spiritual maturity. Number three, you don't use your time wisely. Boy, that could be said of so many of us. Have you ever just time passes and you've been kind of frittering time away? Three hours have passed and you said, what have I done? This time you ought to be a teacher. He said they had been believers for a time. They were not brand new Christians. 
And every Christian who's been a believer for a few years, you should be knowledgeable enough in the teachings of a scripture to instruct a younger believer. Every child of God, every believer, new believer needs mentored. We need people that can even teach them the basics and get them going on the right path. Number four, he said, you have a constant diet of milk and you don't want any meat. And he's not talking about a carnivore and a vegetarian. They don't want the meat of the word. He said, you ought to be a teacher by this time. But you are become such as have need of milk and you refuse the strong meat. A lot of people don't want to get into, I'll say, an in-depth Bible study because they just... Some people are bored with it. You know, you've got to come with a hunger that you want to learn, that you want to go into the deeper things of God. Many people like pre-digested food. I just want the teacher to do all the studying, and then she just spits it all out to me. Well, I'm hoping you take your lessons and you dig in for yourself and let that word come alive in you. So the milk, he says, is the first principles of the oracles of God. All of that refers to what Jesus Christ did on earth, the few years that he was here on earth. You and I begin our Christian life on the basis of his finished work on earth, right? What did he do? He came, I think I have them listed here, yeah. His birth, his life, his teaching, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Now he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Okay, those are the basics, Now, but Peter tells us you're now to grow in grace and you're to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. So the meat of the word as we get into the meat, we're going below the surface. We're going below the surface. And he says, what is Jesus doing in heaven? Do we truly understand that his ministry is our high priest? We grow in the Christian life based on Uh, the basis of his unfinished work in heaven. Now, meat can only be handled with growth and development, and you got to have teeth to chew it, right? Okay, so handling the meat of the word needs to be worked up to. You don't go to the meat till you've got your solid in your foundation, and you know the basics. The meat of God's word is not something that can be read and understood at a glance. So many of you have heard me say, Sometimes when I'm studying, uh, when I grew up, they had a program. If you read three chapters on weekdays and five on Sunday, you'll finish the whole Bible in a year. And then I got a little certificate or a blue ribbon. You know, that would motivate me. But you know what? I I, I didn't get much out of it doing it that way. There are days I may spend a long time in a couple of verses. But I study more and dig into something rather than read three or four chapters and somebody says what'd you read and I say I'm not quite sure are y'all with me on that okay so surface level bible reading will create a surface level Christian and many times when you're reading and studying do you find this reminds you of something else so you go over here to see what that says and you know that's sometimes how I get going uh over here for a while (laughs) Okay, and you and I have a command. I am to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, and I can rightly divide the word of truth. Meat requires study, research, thought, reasoning, and some struggle to understand. You have to understand. You've got to look at things in context. Always consider the context. I'm going to put a plug in here for Wearsby's commentary, Uh, Warren Wearsby. And the thing is, you can get it online. So like yesterday when I was reading my psalm for the day, I have my Bible in front of me reading, and then I have his comments on my computer screen because he is excellent in everyday layman's term. And he will give you background and help you to understand. But you can download the whole commentary. I have, have it in print, but I've been using it on the computer. And you can say, oh, I'm going to read First John 3 or something today. You pull it up on your screen, and he will explain to you. And it, he just makes it, everything very clear. 
So if you're wanting something to help you understand more what you're reading, I suggest him. He's a good start. Warren Wiersbe. Okay. He was called the pastor's pastor. And he was the, pre he was the pre preacher of Moody Bible in Chicago for years. And a lot of preachers used his commentaries to start with. Number five. You're immature because you're not skilled in using the word and you fail to apply what you've learned. Head knowledge doesn't do you a lot of good if you don't apply it in your life. He says in verse 13, everyone who partakes only of milk, you're not accustomed to the word of righteousness because you're an infant. So an immature believer, they'll listen to any preacher on the radio, on TV, somebody's book, whatever, and they can't even tell if the person is speaking truth or not. They can't tell because they don't know the word of God well enough. Research shows that upwards of 70% of the contemporary church are spiritually immature and carnal. That's a large percent, and it may be more now. This was a couple of years ago. Do you think this is why the church seems so ineffective? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's my wolf in sheep's clothing. Is this one of the reasons you think false prophets are basking in the spotlight and true teachers are being ignored? Maybe their congregations are dwindling. But the people who are speaking what people want to hear, they're growing. Duh. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 3. He says, And I, brethren could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. You're just a baby in Christ. I fed you with milk. I couldn't give you solid food, for even now you're not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. You're carnal, because I see envy and strife and divisions among you. You are carnal and behaving like mere men, because somebody says, I'm a Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos. And he says, when you do that, you're acting carnal. So I gave you a little chart. There are two kinds of believers in the body of Christ. Everyone. So just because you're in the body of Christ doesn't shield you from being carnal. Because there's a lot of carnal believers in the body of Christ. So you see spiritual, they're capable of eating meat. They mind the things of the spirit, they're led by the spirit. Whereas carnal believers only want the milk. They mind the things of the flesh and they're walking after the flesh. And then I gave you scriptures to go with that. So let's look at the carnal man just a little bit. I'm born again, but I will not respond to the clear teachings and authority of the Word of God. And one of our commands is to grow up and mature into the fullness of Christ. His lack of, dis of response denotes his inability to digest the Word of God. Babies in Christ tend to avoid strong doses of the Word. Because they know the word will convict them of their wrongdoing. And then if they haven't uh, seared their conscience with a hot iron, the conscience will prod them, you need to change. You need to change. You need to give this up. You need to quit associating in these kind of conversations. You shouldn't be watching that particular television show, whatever it is. Infants may even attempt to discredit the word because they want to rationalize and justify their self-serving actions. That's what many people are doing who go find a teacher or a church that will agree with what they want to believe or will justify their sin. Infants rebel against solid food. They don't like it. Do you remember when you fed your little toddler something new for the first time and they spit it out? Yeah, I do. They were passive and are rebellious regarding their new life and position in him. They rebel against God's commands. A lot of people just want to know, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. But then, if that's their attitude, you sometimes wonder, are they truly saved? Immature display, there's evidence of it. He says, you're yet carnal. There's all kinds of envy and strife and divisions. You're carnal and walking like mere men. Fights going on. In the church, you know, people turning against other people, those kind of things. Immature believers, do you see the upper right corner? <laughs> Immature believers won't listen to good counsel. 
and they rebel and affect others in the body of Christ. So Ephesians 4, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Here's our command. Be kind one to another. Be tender-hearted. Be forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. He has forgiven us of much. When we aren't feeding our soul with the bread of life, this commentator said, here are some signs that you're spiritually hungry and you need the word of God. You're discontent. You're impatient. You complain a lot. You're unkind and you're selfish. He said, if you have these things in your life, that's a sign that you need more of God's word. You're spiritually hungry. You're just not eating. So a babe in Christ has difficulty putting away the old self, his self-centered ambitions, and his quest for significance. Infants in Christ, Paul says, walk like just a regular man, a carnal man, and they act like a non-believer. So it is biblically infantile for you to name the name of Christ. I profess that I am a born-again Christian. But yet you display spiritual immaturity and latent insurgency towards God, and you refuse to adhere to the precepts of his word. Somebody says, please don't tell people you're a Christian if you're going to act like you're not. <laughs> Throwing protein-rich food from your high chair is unacceptable. It is rank rebellion. So we're going on to chapter 6 in Hebrews, and God says, you've got to grow up now. And then I'll get back to the meat of the word in chapter 7. You've got to grow up, and guess what? It's not automatic. You can't say, okay, grow me up. I want to be spiritually mature. It begins with a basic content of your present condition. And let me tell you, I, I grew for a while, and you know what happened? I kind of stayed there for a while, and I got discontent again. And then you want to grow some more. Because you need to stay in that state. I, I just want more of God's word. I want him to conform me more to the image of Christ. I want to be more mature and be what he wants me to be. You've got to be intentional. You've got to desire it. And you've got to be diligent. So God's word conveys strong appeals and commands for us. You need to earnestly desire that he will mature you. He says, be diligent to enter. Strive or agonize for the prize. Do you see that it is a striving? It is agonizing. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Well, I can't mortify those in myself. No, but the Holy Spirit will convict you, and as you yield to him, you ask him to mortify those things in you. You're commanded to pursue holiness. You're commanded to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Yet many born-again believers will put on the brakes. I don't want to be called a fanatic. A fanatic? Because I'm obeying the word of God? Here, am I a fanatic who desires, I want to continue maturing spiritually until he calls me home? Or am I guilty of this little frog? I'm nibbling, I'm content. I'm just nibbling around at the truth of God's word, and I'm just content, just like the East Siders. I'll just be a common, mediocre Christian. I don't want anybody to think I am radical. Warning a mediocre Christian is going to resist the call to mature. They'd rather stay mediocre over there on that East Side. But God calls you to grow up in Christ, and he, it's not honoring to Him. If we stop the development and we don't mature. And Tozer says mediocrity is not the highest Jesus offers you. He offers you a life of Jesus Christ being manifested in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Where he fights your battles. He gives you victory in your circumstances. He gives you a peace that passes all understanding. Why do we not want that? We do want it but our actions tell if I really want it. Our obedience so we should not settle for a creed of contentment. Apprehended truths. As I began to see truths and they began to come alive to me, it only awakened my desire 
for the Holy Spirit to keep working in me. Now, you know that if you ask him to keep working and keep growing you and maturing you, what's probably around the corner? A trial. <laughs> and then you have, oh, I have another opportunity to grow and for him to keep working in me because I want to keep moving forward. So in verse 14 of chapter 5, he said, Solid food only belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use, they've been using it. They've been using it. They had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So as I feed on God's word, have it applied in my daily life, my inner spiritual senses get their exercise and they become stronger and keener. And uh, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy, you need to exercise yourself towards godliness. Are there disciplines involved? Yes, yes. He says, bodily exercise profits a little, but your godliness is profitable for all things. And I want you to star the end of this phrase. It has promise of your life that is now and promise of your life to come. Godliness is your key. Godliness is your key for your life to come. So God's word is food and nourishment for my soul. In Matthew, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. And what did he tell them in Psalm 89? He says, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm the one that rescued you from the pit of destruction. I brought you out of that bondage. Open your mouth wide. And what's the promise? I will fill it. Just open your mouth and say, fill me with your word and your truth, your precepts. Therefore, chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, because of all this, I'm going to leave all those elementary principles of the teaching of Christ. We want to go on to perfection or to maturity. And he gives us a warning it is emphatic. There's a peril if you don't progress. You better progress, he says. If you don't move on, you're likely to make an irreversible decision that will keep you in a state of spiritual immaturity. What happens? I'm going, but I make the decision, you know, I'm just so tired of having to do this and this and this. So you make a decision, I'm going to back off for a while. Guess what? you'll probably stay in that state of spiritual immaturity. You make an irre irreversible decision. And what's at stake? Your rewards and your inheritance are at stake. So we have a problem with the church of Sardis. The Christians, he said, were sleeping. They were the walking dead. Remember, they were known to be active. They were known to be alive, to have vitality and life. And Beasley said the appearance of this Sardis church was that of a beautifully adorned corpse in a funeral parlor. But is Jesus deceived? No, not at all. In God's sight, all of these religious activities were a failure because they were only formal and external. They were not infused with the life-giving spirit. So what does that church need? What does an immature believer need? You need the, to stir up the living spirit of God to come to life. You need that fire rekindled. And so Jesus, this is why he comes to this church in chapter 3, verse 1. He proclaims his deity and he says, what am I coming with? The seven spirits of God. That's what they need is the Holy Spirit. He says, I've got the remedy for your deadness and your immaturity. I have the life-giving spirit that you need. This is in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. It will tell you what you get when you get the Holy Spirit. And I gave you a chart that tells you, you get the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and he'll put in you a spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's what you have with the Holy Spirit. And he said, church, this is what you need. Immature believer, this is what you need. The fullness and completeness of the Holy Spirit's ministry. So when you realize that and you realize what you have in the Holy Spirit, He is everything you need to mature. 
everything you need. Just put yourself out there and say, I am yours. I want to be a vessel of honor. Just mold me and make me into what you want me to be. Mature me, grow me. You're all I need. So Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's got hope. He brings hope in the gift of the Holy Spirit and his power to bring you to life. The word is P-H-E-R-O, and it means, think of yourself as a sailboat, and you're going to a destination, that you're being borne along like a ship by the wind. And if you let that wind guide you, it will get you to your destination. That is the idea here in Greek. So, it emphasizes the exertion of power on the individual from an outside source. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. But what if I yield to him? I just let him guide me along. And he's going to have me show up at the judgment seat, my destination, where I'll hear, well done and good faithful servant. It conveys the thought that you need to surrender to that force. What if the ship said, I'm not going to surrender to that wind? It would never get to its destination. It emphasizes, it's in the present tense, it emphasizes the continual need for this activity. You never get to where you don't need the Holy Spirit. Never. Never. So the writer lumps himself in this group needing to be born continually, born along. He said, let us be carried along by God's Spirit. This is when you come into discipleship and maturity. You're learning to let the Holy Spirit carry you along. He says in 1 Thessalonians, He who calls you is faithful. The one who calls you to this life of righteousness, he's the one who will live that life of righteousness in you and through you. When? By your consent. You have to ask for it. You have to... Uh, give your permission for it. He is not going to force maturity on you. It's by your consent. You need to submit to the Holy Spirit who's transforming power. He will complete the work that was started in you. And you say, he's doing all the work. I show up at the judgment seat and he says, here's your rewards. And I say, but you did it all. But these are for you. Your obedience. Judging on your works and your obedience. So in Philippians 1, 6, you and I can be very confident of this thing. He who began the good work in me, he's going to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I have a couple of quotes from Jim Elliott. He says, forgive me, God, for being so ordinary because I claim to know an extraordinary God. We should be extraordinary Christians. We have an extraordinary God. He says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And I heard this on the radio. When you die, you're going to leave all that you have behind. And what am I going to take with me? All that I am. All that I am. So my question for you and myself, who are you? Who are you going to be taking with you? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the truths of this lesson. Thank you that we have the word of God. Thank you that we have the power of the Holy Spirit who will do all this work in us. We're so grateful and so thankful for everything you've provided in our salvation, for our justification, our sanctification, and our future glorification, and in our future serving with you for a thousand years in your kingdom that will come to this earth. Lord, if we truly believe that, may it change and impact the way that we live today. Let it become a solid belief in our heart. And we give you the praise for that in Christ's name. Amen.